Video games and computers are Christmas biz standouts. Atari and Activision settle out of court, and anti-games hysteria begins to rise. These stories and many more on this episode of the Video Game Newsroom Time Machine. I've been waiting a long time for a chance to say this. Stop the presses. Requiescat in pace. Make some crazy money. What is a man? It's me, Mario. What a mess. Get over here! Please save me. Welcome back to another episode of the Video Game Newsroom Time Machine, the show where we travel back in time to find out what was making headlines in the video game and home computer industry 40, 30, or 20 years ago. Today we'll be traveling back 40 years to January of 1982. I'm your host, Carl, and back with us is everybody's favorite co host, depending on who you ask, Mads. Welcome back, Mads. Hi, Carl. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure, dude. Always a pleasure. So, time for obligatory banter. What have you been up to? What have I been up to? So, retro gaming wise, I've been up to finally finishing Goblins. You know the uh, the old well, yeah. adventure game is kind of the uh, the wrong way to describe the the first entry in the Goblins series. Um, it, it's more of just a single screen puzzler, isn't it? But it's, yeah, it is. Yeah, it, it very much is just a visual puzzler with some sprites. Yeah, exactly. But it's a game I've been playing ever since back in the day. I remember getting Goblins 2 actually as a demo on a German Amiga magazine I bought back in the day. And, mm-hmm. and finding out that there was a, a first game there as well, of course, I had to, to find that and play that as well. But I never finished it. And these Just a couple of weeks ago, I think, I, I finally finished Goblins on my PC. I have to ask, because I had Goblins back on the Amiga also back in the day. Yeah, and I probably made it to like the fourth screen, and that was it. I could, I could never quite figure out what the frag I was supposed to do. Did mm-hmm. you make it through without a walkthrough? Yes, I did. All oh my way. goodness! <laughs> how? How? Uh, granted, you're playing it on a PC. I played it on an Amiga. Have you ever tried it on an Amiga? Not the first one. I played the second one on the Amiga back in the oh. day. Yeah, the first one on the Amiga was slow. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the load times are, are, I mean, instantaneous. I'm, I'm playing the, I, I bought it on good old games. Yeah. For nothing, and uh, yeah, it's 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 easy and it's. Uh, I've played like this, Carl, because you know there's a there's an energy counter in Goblins as well. So whenever mm-hmm. you do something wrong, you you be you'll be treated with a, a small little animation of your Goblin getting well his hand stuck or something in his head or something along those lines and he'll, he'll lose some energy but uh, i'd play each screen like this i would uh, load it up there's a loading system where you <laughs> get a code then i yeah. try everything just because part of the fun of playing goblins one is also seeing all the many many different ways that you can fail the screens because there's so much good bespoke animation there uh, pixel animation so i play all the way through try everything figure out what the solution was load again and then do it flawlessly and and write the next code down so I, i'd be ready to load the next screen with full energy every single time yeah and, and if you played it off of floppy disks on amiga every time it had to load that bespoke animation and it would take forever i mean we're not talking champion of the raj bad bad but it was not far off oh, it, it would load within within a single yes oh, yeah, that was yeah cool. because it couldn't fit all the bespoke animation in the one meg of memory okay i'm pretty sure i only ever played the dos version of this yeah 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 it was bad it was uh, and i'm one of those guys that i you give me a game with really good animation and i will suffer through almost anything see my obsession with Don Bluth games, mm. but that loading time was just, and you, of course you're trying stuff and you're constantly losing energy. You're constantly uh, getting killed or, or yeah. whatever, yeah. the equivalent of it. And if it has to load each time, you want to shoot yourself after hours. And there are actually a few, few levels later on where you can't get killed, where, where it, the energy doesn't matter, even though you've got full energy, if you do one thing wrong, you need to start that screen over again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's unfortunately the reason I never finished it, but you're making it sound really, really tantalizing to go back to. Mm, you should pick that up. It works really well. It's just uh, if you buy it on Google Games, it's just playing in, in DOSBox and it, it works brilliantly. 
cool. Okay, I... Uh, Oh, man, it would finally fulfill a fantasy of finishing that game. That was one of those, you know, really cool animation games like uh, Roger Rabbit's Hair Raising Havoc was another yeah, one yeah. that was unplayable on a standard Amiga because of the load times. But, you know, you always saw the screenshots with all the animation. You're like, oh, this has got to be beautiful. Mm. Oh, well. OK, that is very, very cool. Um, so enough chit chat. We have business to take care of today. Yeah. We have great lots game, of business. Please. Oh, yes. Uh, so, everybody, remember, uh, you can support us on Patreon, follow us on Instagram and Twitter. And uh, if you do support us on Patreon, you get uh, certain benefits. Like our last episode was our big panel discussion on uh, Stephen Kent's The Ultimate History of Video Games. And uh, the video version of that is only available to patrons. And uh, I think that's all the plug I need to do. Also remember that for the purposes of our show, when we talk about January 1982, we're always talking about publications dated January of 1982. Obviously, the events happened at some point before that. It's a framing device. Please don't send us hate mail. But if you do have questions, comments, suggestions, our email address is video game newsroom time machine at gmail.com. And you can also find all of this in the show notes below, as well as links to all of the sources for what we're talking about. Ah, oh, okay. I think I said all of that, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I enjoyed the yeah. panel discussion, by the way, mate. That was a good oh, I, I, I enjoyed it too. I mean, I wasn't quite sure where we were going, especially because Ethan really, really has a hard on for, uh, dissing Kent, but <laughs> I think that we ended up with a very, very positive and productive discussion about not only where the topic and the subject of studying video game history has started and where and how it's evolved, but maybe we started working out a roadmap of where it can go in the future. And it, it was a really good discussion. It was Alex Smith of the Create Worlds quarter past and ethan of course of our department of corrections fame and uh, it was a really really good interesting discussion and we're already talking about doing another big panel discussion uh later in the year uh because of course 1982 is the year of the crash mm. and uh so we're going to be building up to that and we're already talking about doing another one sort of the 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 prep for the crash on the anniversary on a very special anniversary that I'm not going to give away just yet. Yeah. But there's a very special anniversary coming up in 82 that we will celebrate the 40th anniversary with the panel discussion. Sounds so, good. Yeah, 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 it'll be good. It'll be good. We're already preparing documents and getting our notes ready, so it'll be fun. Uh, okay, and with that being said, before we turn on the time machine, we send the intrepid co-host of the show back in time to play one of the games that was reviewed or shown in a magazine dated January 1982. We had a few very, very prominent classics to choose from. There was soft porn adventure, which Mads just recently covered on his other podcast. And yeah, like, like this isn't the main one. No, of course. Your main, main podcast, The Retro Asylum. You guys just did a whole awesome deep dive on this. I actually enjoyed listening to that because uh, I've never actually finished it as a Larry fan. That is sacrilege, I know, but I need to catch up on that. Mm. Uh, we thought of you playing Utopia, but uh, that in television controller is still a bit of a mystery on how we're going to solve that. Yeah. But we may come back to it next month. Uh, there was Frogger in the arcade, but you've played that. Uh, but the one game that eclipsed them all as far as awesomeness, uh, as far as uniqueness, and as far as a true sign of the times was a type-in listing from Creative Computing Magazine called Adventures in Video Lab. So, Mads, are you ready for some adventures in video land. As brave as I'm ever going to be. Then thus begins your seven minutes in heaven. Mads, welcome back from your seven minutes in heaven. 
For those who are not familiar with the game, please describe what you just experienced. So what I was playing was a uh, text adventure game, really. I was trying to figure out uh, who placed the bomb on the roller coaster, or at least trying to find a way to remove the bomb from a roller coaster uh, at a fair um, to, to save all the people in the roller coaster, of course. Uh, and the special thing was that while I was playing it, some, some pictures and movie clips were shown in, well, in, in this implementation in another window, but uh, in the real implementation, it would be running off a, um, a laser disc, so shown on the same screen as the Apple II game that you're playing right now. So a, a text adventure, that was quite fun. I, I'm, I'm betting it would be something you'd solve in half an hour. I only had seven minutes, but uh, half an hour is probably enough because it's just a type in listing. But uh, a good text adventure. And then with that added extra bonus of actually having real video clips being played, which is uh, some, some something really special when it's uh, that, that old, isn't it? Oh, definitely. I mean, this was an absolute first. I mean, we're still two years away from Dragon's Lair in the arcades. Mm. And this really was uh, this moment of, okay, we've got this mass media storage. We can control it through computer input. And the setup necessary for this, as far as we know at the time, the only people who ever got to actually play this game, even though it was printed as a listing in its full form with the Laserdisc, were the programmer and David All, who was the editor, uh, chief, uh, the chief of Creative Computing Magazine. As far yeah. as we can tell, nobody else actually got to play this because they were using an add-on card called the Aurora Interface. And that came from a relatively small company. Uh, they probably existed for a few more years. I saw some ads with them listed as dealers for other people's products but i never saw another ad i never saw an actual ad for this interface card as far mm. as i can tell it never actually went into mass production of any kind and uh, i talked to several other people uh about this uh including the first person to implement a, a functional version of this and i'm going to probably kill his name right now uh even though i'm a big fan uh so k savets or savets mm -hmm. uh he is also of the antic podcast fame if you guys don't listen to that antic it's a uh, podcast uh, dedicated to the atari 8-bit line and old atari computer culture absolutely amazing show they do some amazing interviews there's people on there that i definitely need to uh yeah I need to steal for interviews on our show. So, uh, uh, but yeah, so I talked to him. He did a version of this. There's a link to the video in the, the show notes. And he did it the same way that the version that you played, which is uh, browser playable. I'll also put that in the show notes with a two monitor solution. But in the original, with the, in the original version in Creative Computing, the Aurora card allowed for screen input switching so you had the add-on card for the apple II, both the uh, video feed for the apple II and the video feed for the laser player uh, laser disc player went into this card and you could use a command in the code to switch which of the feeds was being displayed on the screen so when you activated something you put in some option in the text adventure that activated a clip it would switch over uh, to the video feed, show you the clip, and then switch back to the Apple II when it was done. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And uh, it was very interesting because uh, what uh, Kay was telling me that his implementation, he had to take all that code out. And if you read the original uh, programmer's notes in the magazine, he had to fa calculate in the the access speed of the uh, LaserDisc player, which was not very fast at the time, and build in delays so that all of this would work somewhat uh, reasonably well. Yeah, and you, so, you told me that they've actually they're controlling it not in not through a like an official control socket on the LaserDisc player, but just through the socket or the port that would uh, normally have the remote in it. Exactly. So yeah. that means I'm, I'm guessing that if you want to go to 10 minutes and 32 seconds, you you need to just hold down the, the the search forward button for n seconds and then release. No, no. And this is the difference 
difference between Laserdisc and later formats like DVD. In Laserdisc, you can actually tell it which frame you want to go ah, to. Ah, wonderful. Okay. Yeah, because Laserdisc is not using any compression. This is why the this probably 90-minute movie came on like four sides of discs. Okay. So you could actually – it was just doing raw – data uh for each frame analog yeah. data yeah. so you could literally tell it i want frame 3454 and it would just jump to that frame okay okay and that's also why you get those really nice still images sometimes yeah. as yeah. opposed to video clips because they're just basically putting in the frame number okay but it also means that there's only one very specific version release of the movie and well, we haven't even talked about this yet but uh, this whole thing is running off of an actual commercial movie, and it's the first disc of that movie. And that movie being this really low, not super low budget, but pretty low budget uh, disaster movie called Roller Coaster from, I believe, 72. Mm, okay. And, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's a totally forgettable movie, but because it has this somewhat corny plot, because it has a lot of different locations and because it has the death sequences, you can actually make a game built around. It. Yeah, yeah. And an interesting one at that. I mean, that's uh, that, that homepage that he made there where you can test it out. I definitely recommend that the listeners go and have a look themselves. Oh, definitely. I mean, this is, uh, I mean, it, nobody knows if it really had any long term influence. Kay told me he did contact the original programmer, and even he doesn't really acknowledge it as the first Laserdisc game because he says it's not the technology that would inspire Dragon Slayer. Okay. Uh, but it, it is interesting that it beats everybody else to the punch, mm. and it really shows that hacker culture. That was the foundation of magazines like Creative Computing. I mean, it's in the title. You know, find in incredibly creative and innovative ways of using the machines. Hmm. Uh, and it's also a little bit interesting or telling because in the same issue in the news section, David all goes off on a little mini rant and he actually uses the headline that the laser disc industry is their own worst enemies because he apparently contacted Pioneer, the makers of the laser disc player that this worked with, and asked if they could show their game using the, their player at their booth at CES, you know, to yeah. show off the cool uses. And they were like, uh, no, and, and we can't do that because we're probably, this interactive use of the movie footage is probably a violation of the contract between the studios and SAG, the uh, Screen Actors Guild, mm. the union for the, um, uh, for the actors, because they didn't agree to for this kind of use. Mm. And w w no, we're not doing this. It would open up a huge can of worms. And they were probably very right because yeah. uh, uh, most studios at this time were still very, very reluctant to put stuff on home video for fear of copying. Uh, they weren't uh, happy with that. Plus all those old contracts where home video, for example, hadn't been thought of. Uh, getting the permissions or renegotiating the contracts with the original actors and directors to be able to figure out, okay, wh what kind of royalty do you get? Because the original contracts only foresaw re-releasing it in theaters and maybe television. And this is one of the reasons why there's so many really cool old movies that are not available. Mm. Uh, things like Porgy and Bess, for example, a famous musical with tons of famous actors. You can't get it because they've never been able to work out a deal with the heirs of the people who wrote of the guy who wrote the original musical score mm. uh, because he's like no 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 we don't want to do it and it's like well how much you want they want too much now the whole movie is locked down and you can't get a home video release of it for that reason mm. so yeah this would have opened up all sorts of legal problems for them and probably also tanked future possibilities for releases of laser discs yeah makes sense that they didn't want to do that no exactly mm. but uh david all cannot understand it he's totally ticked off he's like don't they see the innovation and everything <laughs> and he's like and, and you and it's just this clash 
as far, I mean, and I'm always analyzing, you know, the, the ultimate uh, Monday morning quarterbacking 40 years later, but uh, it really does feel like he, it, it, the hacker culture of, well, we can do it, so, so we should do it. And the realities of, you know, legal uh, obligations and contracts and so forth, just clashing hardcore. I mean, in many ways, what we see today with the internet and so forth. Mm, yeah. So uh, interesting stuff. Again, all the links uh, are down below. Everybody should really try this game out. It's really cool. Yeah, agreed. Cool. So uh, I think that has resolved the seven minutes in heaven. Let's check in real quick with our Department of Corrections, our good friend Ethan Johnson of the History of How We Play blog, to find out what I got wrong in our December 1981 Welcome back, Ethan, to the Department of Corrections. So, yes, it's a new year, a brand new day. We are going to absolutely make this a positive one. Isn't that right, Carl? Yes, I, I feel the positivity rolling over me. You're going to shower me with accolades of my wonderful. Uh, uh, I wouldn't and... go that far. Uh, let's, <laughs> let's reel it back a little bit. But yes, we're in the Department of Corrections. We are here for the last. The final, the absolute pinnacle of the corrections for the ones. Before we move on to the twos, aren't you excited, Carl? Yes, very much so. The ones were a difficult year, and as we enter the year of the crash, we need mm -hmm. to put those days when people thought that, you know, this was a fun industry, but not all that big. And, in, and enter into the realm of, oh my god, this is the gold rush, and let's crash this baby. All right, well, December 1981, let us move on with it. Of course, first, we have a comment for the co-host this time. The wonderful... And what did he say? Uh, he... He was wondering about the, those Interton consoles. What, what a strange <laughs> little thing, yes. So the Interton is actually not a programmable console, but it has multiple games. It is a very uh, strange... Interesting. It almost sounds like the original Odyssey. Not quite like the Odyssey, more like the um, the uh, Coleco Telstar arcade, uh, gotcha. uh, where it had kind of the brains in each and every cartridge, whereas the, the system was more or less a hookup to the TV with controls on it and things. Uh, it's quite complicated, but basically they have like these very complex ICs in, in the cartridges. You plug it in, but it doesn't interface to a microprocessor. It just runs it straight through the TV. Uh, these were mostly made in Hong Kong based on uh, General Instrument AY chips. Uh, and they were more popular in Europe than in the U.S. There were a couple versions that were in the U.S., uh, but Interton was just one of the companies putting out these identical systems all around Europe. Awesome. Very cool. Very cool. Thank you for doing that background research. Yes, if you if you had known about it, like in, in 78, you would have covered stuff like this, but you did not. You were ignorant back then, but this is a new year, a new day. We can... We can be enlightened once more. In my defense, I only did two months in 78, November and December. So I might still be able to cover it when we finally start closing the loop. <laughs> but you talked about them now, so at least we can mention this very obscure bit of gaming history. That's true. We catch next, it all at some point. <laughs> next on the plate, you uh, played a Computer Space, but you called it an emulation. Bad Carl, or oh, it is a I, simulation. I, I, I know, I know better. I know better. Yes, that was a slip of the tongue. There is a, a very, like, a, as far as I am told, there is a very good FPGA implementation of computer space, which is way more accurate. But the version that you played was basically a totally reprogrammed version, trying to replicate what the arcade did, not at a circuit level, just trying to figure it out in the software. Yeah, uh, and, and we played it because it was as close as we could get. But yeah, an FPA, FPGA implementation would be fun. Yes, so if you have a mister, I believe it is out there for you to try. But I have not tried it myself. Next on the list, this is not uh, something to Carl, but rather something he repeated from, from the magazines. 
uh, they called Battlezone a quote unquote dud. It now Battlezone was not a failure. It sold quite a few units, but from an operator's perspective, that might be the case. Uh, they overproduced Battlezone. They had to sell it for um, for uh, like less than they wanted to, but uh, it was not a bomb in the sense that nobody played it. Well, and, no. And they also said that it was one of many games that year that had very strong starts or were very promising at the trade shows, but uh, didn't have enough legs in, in the actual field to basically make back their expenses. So what the operators paid for it, it didn't generate enough money to actually uh, make that up. Yeah, I believe that it was a more expensive cabinet, but it did also get onto the software charts as well. So that's how you can tell that it was at least somewhat successful. But again, expectations versus reality. They wanted another Asteroids and they didn't get it. Yeah, that's true. And on another subject of the 1980 AMOA, of which you can go and look for the special that we did last year <laughs> of, yes. of this very topic, uh, Defender. Uh, you s said that uh, Defender has a joystick that goes up, down, left, and right. No, uh, j the Defender joystick only goes up and down, and you thrust left or right depending on which way you're facing, which is controlled by a different button. Yeah, it's the uh, so you have four buttons, I believe. It's the five five button. Uh, oh, the so. warp button. Uh, yeah, there's uh, was was that already in the original Defender or only yeah. in Stargate? No, it's in the original. Hyperspace, okay. shoot, thrust, change direction, smart bomb. Those are the five oh, buttons. Oh, yeah, you're right. Okay, cool. Yeah, so way there too you complicated go. of a game. <laughs> and one more on this. Uh, there, there are no reactions from people at the time saying at the 1980 AMOA that Pac-Man's too easy and Defender is too hard. As I described in the special, yeah. there really wasn't that kind of of commentary on this sort of thing at the time not at the time but in the december trades there was i found a line about this in one of the december trades either replay or um or uh, what's the other one play meter there is actually in their retrospective on the year they actually say exactly that and that's why i said it in 1981 it, or 1990 in december 1981 Okay, so that, yeah, again, that by is not then, a thing. Yeah, but yeah. by then, that had already sort of seeped into the culture. That uh, that idea uh, is already present in December of Critical retrospectives that are that far off, I don't like transplanting them back into the era. That It seems, you know. No, no, I'm not saying yeah. that. I'm, I'm not saying that it wasn't, but I'm, what I'm saying is the idea was already there at this point. It's probably similar to the way that the myths around E.T., didn't take 20 years to uh, to foment they were kind of there by the end of 83 84 which they never should have been but we'll tackle that oh, when we course. get there in i think may 1983 something like that yeah the, you'll, you'll cover that. <laughs> oh yeah well i mean the yeah that'll be the release of it but the the no 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 the release is in the, in the holiday season of 82 the burial oh, is right, right, uh right. what the Almogordo burial is like may 83 something like that. true i need to make sure i have but i have that listed but yeah i won't forget that one yes next we have uh talking about the namco game that atari is licensing it was not the first game that atari licensed and released because Back in the 70s, Atari had licensed and released Namco's F1, which was an electromechanical racing game that they had put together. And Atari did release that in the States, but uh, this was the first video game that they were licensing and releasing that Atari had not made itself. Interesting. I didn't know that Atari actually did any electromechanical game. Yeah, I mean, they tried. Pinball, you know, but yeah. Yeah, they, they tried at the pinball and they tried a couple of other things. Um, and I, I'm trying to remember if they had a game that they actually developed themselves. Uh, I know that there were some prototypes that they didn't put out, but uh, th that's something that I'm working through currently, um, kind of cataloging all the interesting stuff that uh, was coming out in the mid-70s. So I can't remember exactly. But yes, F1 was one of their... Oh, cool. 
uh, that you were saying the BBC Micro base had like 48k of memory, but no, the uh, for the cheap model of the BBC Micro, which I think is the BBC Micro A, is a 16k base. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, I really did not know how much uh, they originally shipped it with. But 16K is so weak. Oh, geez. Yeah, but it, I mean, in terms of, especially in Britain, where you really don't have a lot of income to play around with, um, that was actually pretty good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, the, well, the Spectrum models are 16K and 48K. True. And, I mean, going up against the VIC-20 with only five, I mean, still sounds pretty impressive. Yes. That's the end of December 1981. Very cool. I think that we... Uh, we did that one justice. Yes. But before we go, of course, it's a new year. Of course, there you can't be saying 1981 when you're in your time machine going to 1982. So, brand new premiere of the new sound effect. Ooh. New sound effects. But wait, before we play those, we have to go check in with the co-host of this episode so that they can give some pithy remark before we turn those on. Fine. Or do you want me to do? Uh, you want me to do it here? I know. You, well, do, do what do what you like, Carl. For stall, however you like. For if you're going to do a 1942 jump or whatever, do your thing. Actually, but I set it up yeah, in case you need it. Yeah, we're going to a 42 jump. We're going to a 52 jump. We're going to a 62 jump. Before he delays my masterpiece. You're going to have to wait until after these stories to get the new sound effects. Anyways. Yes, and for all of those listeners who have never scrolled to the bottom of the show notes, Ethan is our master of sound effects here. So, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, Ethan, I've already heard it. It sounds great. People will love it. But uh, yes, we, we do have to turn back the clock first to go to 1942. I can't, I can't make sound effects for every decade, Carl. You're killing me. I know, me I know, I know. Plus, I mean, what are you going to do with 42? You know, put together some old ads for buying war bonds or something. Actually, yeah, that, <laughs> that would, would sound kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyways, on to 82. See you then. So that, that was a whole lot, Carl, wasn't it? Do you think you finally got a handle on the Defender Contest now? Uh, it was a lot of little stuff. I'm not, uh, it, it, it's always there's always a couple little things, and I can't believe I said simula I said emulation as opposed to simulation. But uh, I mean, I can live with this. I can definitely. Live. Yeah, of course, of course. But but it's good you've got Ethan. Oh no, definitely, dude. I I I believe that it is important for us to make sure that uh, accuracy is kept, so this truly can be a record people can go back to, even if they have to listen to two episodes to figure out what happened. <laughs> <laughs> okay but enough chit chat this episode's gone long long enough and we do have quite a bit to cover today so oh, we do let's turn on the time machine and before we can head back to january of 1981 we need to turn back even further all the way back to january of 1942 i guess we'll be jumping back to january of 1982 as well Oh, did I say 81? Oh, oh my yeah. goodness, I'm still stuck last year. Yes, 1982 <laughs> as well. So, we don't have a sound effect for this one, so let's jump right into 42. Is, is this a new record? Have we ever been that far back? Oh, yeah, we've been talking about the 40s for a little while now okay. because of the anti-pinball rage oh, that's, that's been true. fomenting for the last, yeah, for over a year now, but we, we had a couple big cases the last few months. So the first one is New Jersey Town raises pinball licensing fees by 1,900%. Exactly. Wow. Nutley, I know, you got to love it. Nutley, New Jersey has voted to raise the license fees for pinball machines from $10 to $200. One concerned citizen, a Mr. Charles V. Vroom, that's V R O O M. I just love that name. <laughs> yes. Argue, <laughs> argued the machines were a menace to children. Now, uh, for a little bit of context here, remember December seventh, nineteen forty one, is the attack on Pearl Harbor. Mm. Uh, uh, December eighth, nineteen forty one, is the declaration of war, and the United States has entered the war. Uh, so, while we had this big anti uh, pinball uh, thing going on before the U.S. entered the war. The uh, entering the war is going to 
raise the stakes dramatically. And it's going to, re- we're going to be seeing that probably over the next few months, that there's going to be an alignment of or that atmosphere in the country can't be forgotten when we're looking at all these stories and some of the very draconian measures that will be passed. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, uh, so other cities like Newark, they made the machines illegal and one player complained to the cops when the owner of a store refused to pay him out. Now, remember, pinball is still is either a just pure chance game or it's a pure chance game that also has tiny little bit of skill and that tiny little bit of skill gets you payouts. Yeah. Uh, and he refused to pay him his $2 and 10 cents in earnings. Now remember with inflation, you've got to at least tenfold this, if not more. So, yeah. Yeah. and he, he, so the, this idiot goes to the cops and says, this guy, remember he's in a city where the machines are illegal. Didn't pay me. <laughs> The two dollars and ten cents he owes me, and so he ended up getting fined twenty five dollars and berated for wasting his money as opposed to buying war bonds by the judge. Uh, yeah, and the store owner got hit with a two hundred dollar fine for having the damn machine. Uh, that's harsh. Yeah, but I guess he won't be complaining about losing two dollars again anytime soon. No, no, definitely not. Definitely not. That's good. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so this this is the kind of story. There's quite a few of these. I'm not going to cover all of them in the show because they're probably going to keep popping up. But this is just you know quick browsing through the New York Times of the stuff that I found. Mm, yeah. So uh, more from New York here. New York cracks down on pinball. Yeah, this is the Big Apple now. After a ruling by former police captain Magistrate Haddock that all pinball machines were in fact gambling devices, even those with no perceivable payout mechanism, Mayor LaGuardia has swooped in using plans made months earlier and ordered extra cops deployed to seize as many of the machines as possible, in no small part fearing that an injunction may come down from another court. Within less than a week, a quarter of the estimated 11,000 machines in the five boroughs had been seized, and the coins in them would go post-conviction of the owners into the police pension fund, and the metal in the machines would be melted down for bullets. Mm -hmm. Here we see the the war coming in again. Oh, yeah. But the nice part is they admit that they had already made the plans months and months earlier. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So, I mean... It's just like now they have the protection and the fact that this magistrate is a former police captain. It's just it was just like oh, New York cop corruption. It's such a classic thing. Yeah. Yeah. But it, everything I mean, at this point, everything is war effort. There were even little, you know, cartoon images inside the newspaper about Uncle Sam, you know, mm. buy war bonds and, you know, don't throw this newspaper away. You know, it can be reused as war materials and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. But I'm guessing they can still make some money off it because uh, it says here national pinball and slot machine tax rakes in the bucks. On October 1st, a new tax on pinball and slot machines, $10 per year for the silver ball and $50 a year for one-armed bandits, has brought in $4.7 million. Wisconsin led with $477,000, and New York was a close second. Hmm. So I guess that's, uh, that's, that's all gone now because now the machines are illegal, so they won't be, be getting all of those taxes. Well, see, this is the thing. They're not illegal on the federal level. Mm, okay. And it's, so it's each city seems to be passing these ordinances. Now, there's probably also some states that are passing uh, laws forbidding the machines or forbidding certain types of machines. Yeah. But at this point, it seems that it's really a city by city or county by county deal. Okay. And that's why the federal government is passing this. I mean, we're talking New York as a state. It's more than just a couple of cities. Hmm. I mean, so you've got all the other areas and anything that's outside the five uh, uh, boroughs of New York are is also not no longer under the control of LaGuardia. So it's it's one of those things where a lot of this is still out there. But remember, most of these places have these uh, licensing fees. 
Yeah. And those are in addition to this national tax. And you might think, well, $10 per year, not that big of a deal, but uh, it, it really adds up at this point in time. Yeah. And uh, if the lo- local fees are going up or they decide to come and get it, well, they already know where all the machines are because you paid for the licensing fee. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Which can't be forgotten. Yeah, there were even some anecdotes about you know mobsters uh, being caught um, uh, with trucks loaded up with the pinball machines, trying to get them to New Jersey as fast as possible. <laughs> and the the magistrate even put out an order saying, you know, even the ones in transit, even if they're not currently plugged in or in a public location, you can still get them because they're all illegal. And yeah, yeah it's just crazy. Mm. A pinball going down in 42. Yes. Now, let's turn on the time machine, jump forward 10 years to January of 1952. Yes. First story here is that Ordvac makes the grade. Ordvac, or the Ordnance Discrete Variable Automatic Computer, has passed its final test so that it can be deployed at the U.S. military's Ballistic Research Laboratory. The machine would get a sister machine, the ILIAC-1, making them the first computers with interchangeable code, as well as being the first machines with a compiler. So these were used for uh, doing calculations in their ballistics research? Well, not ballistics research. It was more like ballistics tables. Uh, So one of the big problems in warfare um, up until this point was when you shot off a shell from a cannon, you didn't really know where it was going to land. So if you watch uh, anything about, for example, pirate ships and the like, Mm. they would always have to shoot off three cannonballs. The first one would be short, the next one would be long, and then you knew, okay, in the middle is the point where you want to hit. And uh, what they then started doing was creating these uh, these calculation tables. So these guys would be out in the middle of a foxhole with a grenade launcher, and they'd look at this table and figure out, okay, speed wind goes this way, uh, I want to go this far up, and there's this much inclination. They'd have to figure out as they're under fire – you know, what angle to use to hit the enemy. Yeah. And uh, as you get more and more different types of deployment, uh, and also because these lists were originally done by hand, you can get far more complex tables if you calculate it with a computer, and the computer just spits out this table that has tons more variations and a ton, a ton more factors built into it without the inaccuracies that a human could do. And that's what a lot of these original computers were built to do, was yeah, makes sense. just calculate these tables in a much more accurate way. Mm. Um, yeah. And the cool thing here is that these are the first two compatible computers. There's yeah. never been a compatible computer before. <laughs> I mean, these will always bespoke pieces of hardware with their own languages, their own uh, memory layouts and everything else. And there's going to be a third computer joining these. So there's going to be a third one of these built um, a year or two later. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it's only got 40 bits of memory, which think about is kind of crazy. Not kilobits, bits. 40 bits, that's not a lot. Yeah, that's it. 40 bits. Okay. Uh, and it used, and this was also the first computer that used vacuum tubes instead of magnetic drums for them. Mm. Okay. So, I mean, huge, huge uh, pioneering move forward, uh, and uh, really, really cool to see that uh, you know we're starting to get this idea that you will have interchangeability in these computers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll be many, many years before we actually get that in the home as well. And it's going to be a while. It's definitely going to be a while. Well, I mean, once you get mass produced, I mean, all Commodore 64s were identical machines. But, true, true. But you the, know, between it's... the different models, there wasn't that much uh, you could reuse. Oh, yeah, definitely not. I mean, a VIC-20 uh, and a C64, there was no reusable code. I mean, mm. at least not executable code. No. Mm. Okay. Uh, so next piece of news is the electronic fighter jet simulator delivered to the Navy. The Glenview Na- uh, Naval Air Station received delivery of the first 
Banshee Simulator. The simulator, designated 2F9, was built by the electronics division of the Curtis Wright Corporation, and it is a replica of the twin jet fighter operated by the Navy. The simulator can replicate a variety of possible real-world problems, including technical glitches, to help pilots practice the proper responses until they become instinctive prior to actually taking flight, as well as practice coordinated flight maneuvers with teammates. Mm, that's quite quite early to have uh, full-on simulators like that, isn't it? Uh, it is. Uh, there, I believe there were a few other examples of something like this but it wasn't they weren't electronic as far as i can tell oh. mm. uh they were i mean uh, they would do things like you know shake back and forth and whatever else but okay. here it's really about those lights going on and you know the feedback from the electronics in the, the actual machine's dashboard and simulating those uh signals which really uh makes this one stand out I'm guessing this would be a full-on rebuild of the entire innards of the cockpit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's basically, as far as I can tell, I couldn't find any pictures of it, but it is the cockpit as it would normally be seen. Okay. Yeah. And uh, Curtis Wright, interesting, is actually made up of, it was a joint, the joining of two companies, uh, Curtis Aeroplane and Wright Aeronautical Corporation, which was the original company founded by the Wright brothers. Oh, okay. I didn't know. And they're still around. They're still a major player in this field. Mm. Uh, so that was kind of cool. I, I was like, right? That can't be. And no, this is the company of the Wright brothers. It still, it still exists in some form. Okay. Uh, in a, and in addition, they would also, uh, shortly after this, go on to make simulators for a variety of military and civilian aircraft. They did it for Boeing and McDonnell Douglas and all sorts of stuff. Mm. So, yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, nice. Okay. On to 62. On to 62. U.S. Congress holds hearings on pinball. Back to pinball. Uh, back to pinball. The U.S. Attorney General Robert Kennedy is pushing for a ban on the interstate sale of pinball games due to their use by crime syndicates for gambling. Martin Nelson, an attorney for Bally, argued that while the games are used for gambling by some, the real test should be whether or not the games require any skill. Okay, so so remind me when we're up to sixty two now. What what would a pinball game be at this point in time? Well, and this was actually a question I had as well, and Alex Smith set me straight. Mm. So uh, in sixty two, we would have pinball machines that are very similar to what we recognize today. Okay. You know, with counters, obviously not digital, but you know, counters, points, blah blah blah. But there's another type of pinball machine at this point which is known as a bingo pinball machine. Now, they're calling them gambling-type pinball machines in all the articles at this point. There were like three yeah. or four articles in a row. And I do have a link uh, to a really great article from thisweekinpinball.com in the show notes that gives an explanation of these bingo pinball machines. And the way it worked, and I'm probably getting some of the details wrong, is you would go up to the to the cash register or whoever's uh, running the joint, and they would give you a bingo card, you know, with random numbers on it. Yeah. And then you would go to this machine, you'd put it, uh, slide that in, and uh, you would then start playing the game. And as you got to different targets, and most, and this wasn't really a skill game it was, it was more you know the ball bouncing around and falls into different holes okay and as it falls into the holes it lights up the different numbers and Did you're you trying to get or... uh i don't know some okay. of them may have had flippers some of them didn't i honestly don't know mm. uh again the article goes into way more detail and i i just skipped over it, I have to admit, but this was a sub-genre of pinball that Bally was very big in. Mm. Uh, Gottlieb, the major uh, uh, opponent to the, uh, their major competition, was adamantly anti-gambling and always okay. had been. So they were actually in the background promoting a ban on these kind of pinball machines. Mm. And so this is where Bally is trying to save their business by saying, hey, if the game requires skill, it doesn't matter if you're winning something or not. It's not gambling because it's not a game of chance. Okay. And they're promoting, trying to push 
that definition of it. And Robert Kennedy is trying to get Congress to say, no, get rid of all pinball, or maybe at least just these. It's not clear from the articles if he was going for a complete ban on pinball altogether, which probably would have made sense because he would have argued, well, if we make this one type, the ping, uh, bingo thing, we can't really define what is, you know, what element is illegal. They're just going to be become whack-a-mole. They'll just come yeah, up with some yeah. variation that uh, curtails the definition. If we just make pinball uh, illegal altogether, we get rid of it. And historically, Kennedy uh, Kennedys went hard against the mafia. Mm, they were yeah. really making the mafia their, their, you know, this is the thing we're going to try to fight. And so because pinball had this reputation of being connected with gambling and illegal activities and so forth, it, it just seemed like a, an easy thing, uh, an easy win to get, uh, go if they could actually get it banned. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, the bingo ones are going to fade away fairly quickly. I don't know if they fade away because of this directly, but uh, I don't think they last too much longer after this. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I've never seen anything about the, um, I mean, the first pinballs machines I saw would have been early, early 80s. So mm. that would be uh, just akin to what we still have today. Exactly. I mean, uh, and those machines already existed at this point as well, more or less. Mm. I mean, obviously the technology has changed, the type of targets and stuff have also evolved. But, uh, you know, flippers at the bottom of the field, you shoot up and try not to lose the ball is... Bombers and kickers. There you go, bumpers and kickers. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, I mean, it's pinball, it's silver ball, you gotta love it. Uh, but yeah, so this was an area that I also didn't know. And there was one picture in a New York Times article where I was looking at it going, okay, the back class is a little weird. I couldn't really figure it out, but it was a very poor shot and very much from the side. And then, uh, like I said, Alex uh, set me straight uh, about the uh, bingo thing. He also did a great episode. I'll put a link to it. The history of Bally and Gottlieb. Uh, well, it's primarily about the history of Gottlieb, but they t- he talked uh, very extensively about this, and he was talking about the gambling side of this. But I I didn't understand it well, the first time I listened to the episode exactly what the differences were in these machines. But uh, yeah, so really cool stuff. Uh, interesting little side note in the history of pinball. Yeah, cool. Agreed. Ready to jump into the time machine again, mate? Yes, uh, we got nothing for 72 this time, but oh, we've got some fun stuff for 82. Yes. So, and this is where we have sound effects, our brand new sound effects for the year that Ethan so uh, nicely supplied and he already told you about in the Department of Corrections. Welcome to January of 1982. Mads, what's our first story? Christmas season is a bust for retail. With the exception of video and computer games, that is. Retailers tried to entice buyers with massive price cuts early in the season, only to see their profits disappear. The only bright spot coming out of the holiday season are video games and home computers. Of course, we're talking about uh, the United States here. Sorry for the rest of the world. The toy trades, which are a bit uh, a bit behind with the January cover dated issues, only including anecdotes from November are already preparing for big movement in console games with the VCS often being sold out despite good stocks of cartridges and action happening in the area of the Intellivision and VIC-20. Most electronic games are floundering with a few exceptions like Entex's licensed Pac-Man and Galaxian games. Mm, So everything sold out. Sounds just like these days, eh? (laughs) <laughs> but well, uh, for, for yes other reasons no. for other reasons yeah i mean the consoles are sold out the game's not so much no uh, that, that's like today. Yeah. i've been trying to buy myself a ps5 for a year now <laughs> it's, it's impossible <laughs> uh that's true that's true but then again are there any games on the ps5 that you can't play on a ps4 no i'm just kidding mm. i know i know not really <laughs> a few i guess <laughs> there you go 
Uh, but yeah, so this uh, re we have to remember again a little historical context here. The United States is going through a really, really severe recession at this point, mm. and they have been uh, for a while. So it really becomes a question of retail worried that they're not going to be able to move anything, but video games and home computers seem to be the big exception to all this. Uh, in the New York Times, that's the newspaper, obviously it's more up to date. Uh, there were a couple stories about the massive rise in business failures in uh, January, especially in retail, and uh, it's mostly laid at the foot of a bad Christmas season. Mm, okay. Yeah. But still, video games is going upwards. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, there's nothing to stop it because this is the year of the crash. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. But the next piece of news is that the Commodore and Apple earnings skyrocket. Sales for the fourth quarter of 1981 almost doubled in comparison with 1980 from 45 million to over 70 million. And while Apple had sales go from 67 to 133 million. Yeah, quite a lot. That, that would still be Apple IIs at this point in time, would it? Apple IIs and the absolutely flailing uh, Apple III. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, the Apple III, they had to do the complete redesign. Uh, they just, there's, I didn't include it in the, in the show notes today, but uh, one of the news articles was that they had uh, redesigned the Apple III, a new version with, I believe, a little bit more memory was coming out. Okay. Uh, but it's it's too little, too late. The Apple III is a dud. Um, it's going nowhere. Okay. So next piece of news is Winchesters are on the rise. With the proliferation of home computers, the market for Winchester micro-rigid disk drives, that's what they were calling them back then, mm. or as we call them today, hard drives, has been exploding. The New York Times has an interesting article breaking down the major players, which ones have supplier contracts with computer manufacturers, how these drives compete and complement floppy drives, and the technology from the east that is on the horizon. So at this point in time, a hard drive, it would be a few megabytes and it would be crazy expensive, I guess. Oh, yeah. No, we're talking very, very expensive machines. Uh, and they, but when you consider that you're dealing with floppy disks and we're dealing with five and a quarter inch floppy disks, having mm. something that can suddenly hold nine megs is a yeah. huge, huge deal. Yeah. Uh, and just as a historical side, that name Winchester, that was originally IBM's internal code name when they were developing the first hard drives. Okay. Uh, and not hard drives, the big giant spiral things where you had to grab them out and they were the size of a suitcase. We're talking about uh, five and a quarter or even three and a half inch uh, drives. Okay. Now, the ones IBM developed were five and a quarter, so they fit in the same bays as a uh, normal five and a quarter inch floppy drive. Now, the thing that's coming from the east is that there's a first rumor that Sony might be introducing a three and a half and a three and a quarter inch mm. uh, hard drive, okay. which would be a game changer. And uh, as far as who's working with which manufacturer. Uh, Seagate landed a, a contract with Apple to provide uh, hard drives for the Apple III. Tandon Corporation, which I've never heard of before, uh, they're supplying Tandy and Commodore. And Apple announces new hard drive systems for updated Apple III models because they had to update the Apple III. Mm -hmm. And Irving Gould of Commodore announced five and nine megabyte drives for Commodore machines. And here he's talking basically about the latest version of the PET Commodore, okay, yeah. not the VIC-20, obviously. That all makes sense because you wouldn't want to, I mean, this would uh, probably cost five times the price of the VIC-20 <laughs> itself. So. Oh, more than that. I mean, okay. uh, some of these drives are going for four and five grand. Mm, yeah, this is and that's, for the business machines. And this is 1982 money, so oh god, quad, uh, triple to quadruple <laughs> that. So yeah. yes, yeah. Well, I remember uh, drooling over hard drives way, way later <laughs> in the Amiga years. I really wanted to have a hard drive, but I never could afford it. <sighs> Me neither. I mean that 20 uh, that 20 meg hard drive mm. that you could hang on the side of an Amiga 500. Exactly. Yeah. 
that was that was just so far out of reach it was disturbing yes <laughs> yeah and then you saw some some friend of yours with an ibm pc and he's got like a 60 meg hard drive and you're like screw you <laughs> So, Sears to offer NEC, IBM, and Vector Graphics computers. Retail juggernaut Sears announced that its computer stores will offer three lines of computers, NEC's PC-8000, IBM's PC, and Vector Graphics Series 3 machines. So, I know the NECs and IBMs, but the Vector Graphics Series 3, I don't think I've heard of that before. Me neither. I hadn't heard of them. Uh, now, before you get your hopes up, they have nothing to do with Vector Graphics. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, they're actually, that I believe if I understood it correctly, I just, again, I just glanced over um, a page on them. They were more or less uh, standalone versions of what used to be dumb terminals. So you okay. could uh, plug in a, uh, a floppy drive and stuff. So very much a business oriented machine. Okay. okay. And uh, Sears, I mean, for those people in North America who are old enough, Sears, started out as a catalog company then became a, one of the major retailers they'd have these giant stores that were anchors for uh shopping malls so you could buy everything from you know a drill to a pair of jeans to a uh, washer and dryer whatever in the store and, and now and, computers as well well and now they're setting up separate uh ancillary showrooms for these computers mm. so this is how big this business is now getting that, you know, a company like Sears is going to be offering these showrooms for their standalone machines. Now that I don't believe that they last very long. That's the key here. Uh, uh, because I don't remember seeing any of these at any of the stores, but I did find a list in creative computing where they showed where they were going to be locating these. And there were none at the malls I went to as a kid, but there were okay. two apparently in Seattle just at the malls I wasn't familiar with. Okay, okay. So, who knows? So, Atari opens its regional software acquisition center in Sunnyvale, California. In an attempt to bolster its available software catalog, Atari has opened a 4,000 square foot center that will make Atari computers, technical information, staff, and training available to qualified software developers to allow them to port existing programs to the Atari 8-bit line of computers. Okay, so, so they're making a kind of help center or training center? Well, yes and no. Uh, Atari's got a problem. Their major problem is that they don't have enough software coming from third parties to support the platform. Yeah. Uh, remember, they've been on the market for a couple of years now, and still the software library is pales in comparison to what uh, Tandy has for the Trash 80 and really pales in comparison with what Apple's been able to do. Yeah. Even though it's a far more capable machine, especially in graphics and stuff, the uh, – uh, it does. It, they haven't been able to harness the same kind of enthusiasm for the machine that Apple has been able to get out of their people and out of their users. And so, what Atari did, and we talked about this several months ago, the, their uh, the Atari Software Exchange was basically Atari offering a catalog of programs that you could buy through Atari that were made by third parties. Yeah. And now they're opening up this physical location where developers can come in and they will get assistance in converting their game, uh, their programs to the Atari 8-bit line. And there was even a photo, you know, they've got this room and there's a guy sitting in an Atari, but in the background you can see, I think it was an Apple II and a Trash 80. Okay. So, mm -hmm. you know, well, because if you if you had a program on those systems originally, yep. you may want to have to you may have to go back and forth and look at what you did on the code there and then figure yeah, it out. So, yeah, okay. it's 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 an interesting attempt by Atari to do all this. And you can really see that they're they're making a push, just like with the educational market where they uh, where they've been making inroads to really do that transition to the computer business. Yeah. Of course, it's all going to be for not once we get to Christmas 82, but you can really see they're making some great inroads and there seems to be a real effort and investment in a strategy. Yeah. 
yeah at least they're trying <laughs> oh definitely definitely and i mean it's it's just it's suddenly everywhere the the home the micro computer thing is just exploding yeah yeah so soft side magazine introduces soft side dv the magazine of the future with the rise of professionally made software soft side magazine the trailblazing publication known for its type in basic listings has decided to offer two new versions of the magazine the DV variant will include a floppy disk containing at least four programs and the CV version containing three programs on a cassette. These deluxe versions of the mag will cost $10.50 and $6.25 each. A pretty hefty markup over the current magazine's $3 cover price. So would these just be the the, the listings that's, that are already in the magazine that's been typed in for you or uh, other? Basically, programs? yeah, basically. Mm -hmm. They're promising there's going to be more, but it's basically that. Okay. And uh, this is part of a recently named uh, editor of the magazine, uh, Randall Kotwitz. His move to reinvent SoftSide as something more than just a type in listing. Yeah. And I, I know this because I had a very long and very cool conversation with, with Kotwitz a few months ago. And that's probably going to be the next Patreon, uh, the next interview that I upload to the Patreon feed. Uh, so it was a super nice guy. Very interesting because SoftSide was this cornerstone. Even Al Lowe, when I interviewed him, he said that, you know, SoftSide was amazing. A ton of developers, himself included, learn basic from. They, they yeah. would look at the listings, take them apart. You know, that was like a cornerstone. But we're now entering the phase where People are not buying the computer because they want to program on it. This is around the same time that Bill Staley is of MicroProse is going to buy his first machine. And he's not buying it because he wants to program on it. He wants to buy it because he needs to run VisiCalc. Yes. So uh, this is where they, they realized they had to do more than just the basic listings. They needed to have more editorial content. And if you look at the magazine, uh, this month, it's really, really super heavy on the editorial. There's mm. long articles, ex you know, about philosophy of programming or where technology is going. Uh, in addition to the listings, they're really trying to reinvent themselves. Yeah, yeah. And this may actually be the first disc ma uh, magazine with a disc attached to it. But of course, the move completely makes sense now that the people have seen that computers are something that you can actually just use because there is there's quality software available already or games but for that matter so yeah. you, you don't need to be a programmer you, you can actually just use them as we do today exactly and also think about it uh, those type in listings typing that shit in took forever but oh, if you yes. have the basic program <laughs> on the disk mm. it's not compiled so you can still take a look at the code you can see what's going on it's not a yep. problem the only problem is you have so many different computer platforms and it's not getting any simpler. No. Uh, they even talk about this, how, you know, they're going to start supporting the IBM PC. They might think about some other platforms, but it's it's becoming too complicated. Then you got the TRS-80 Coco, you got the VIC-20 out there. There's just too many different non-compatible platforms for them to support with one yeah. disk. Yeah. And that's going to really be what kind of dooms this experiment. Mm. But that would be, be be something they need to consider for the type in listings as well, I'm sure. I mean, the, unless they keep it to some really, really basic basic, then the, the, it, it'll quickly be a platform specific. And that's what they've had to do. Mm. Okay. And that's really going to be the thing that bites them because, I mean, you can't do anything with graphics because you still have to support the TRS-80 people yeah. or the Commodore PET people. Mm. But at the same time, I mean, you could do something really cool with Petski uh, graphics, mm -hmm. but that's not available on the other platforms. Oh, so sure. it really, there was a game in there this month that was called Gambling, which was a variety of different little gambling games like poker and horse betting and stuff. And the screenshots for it did look very different from system to system. Mm. And I didn't look at the code to see if they actually changed it or if just the disk versions were different. But you can tell it's just not going to be a sustainable model as a cross-platform uh, magazine anymore. 
they're going to have to do something. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of uh, magazines and books, book publishers jump on the gaming bandwagon. The rise of video game mania over the last 18 months has led to a flurry of activity in the book publishing world. The New York Times is a breakdown of current gaming business. Yeah. The New York Times has a breakdown of current gaming books, most of which focus on how to improve play in specific titles like Pac-Man and those that will be hitting shelves in the coming months. Mm, so yeah. Yeah. So, so do you have a do you have a short list of the books? Yes, yes, I do. Of course, I do. Uh, Ken Houston, and we, I think we've talked about him once before. He has a book on a particular note due to his academic accolades and history with blackjack card counting. He became famous for writing the book on how to do card counting in Vegas. Okay. And uh, he would write a couple of books on gaming, uh, on video games. Another is Tom Hirschfield. He's an 18-year-old Harvard student who took a year off to write the 192-page How to Master the Video Game book. Uh, then we have uh, a bunch of other books, but almost everything that's out on the market right now is still focused on the arcade. Yeah. It's just the the real rise of the VCS in 1981. Uh, the book publishers are a little bit behind, but they have a bunch of books uh, that are in the pipeline that are VCS uh, in particular. I believe Houston does a VCS book and Hirschfield also does a VCS book. And uh, there's going to just be a barrage of those uh, coming in the next 12 months. Okay. Yeah. And uh, one thing of particular note, which is a bit of transition to our next story, but books aren't limited to just how to play the games, but we also get a a write-up in Replay Magazine about a book called Amusement Machines, Your Route to Success, a 50-page guide to how to be a successful coin-op operator, written by Dick McNichols who apparently got his start doing coin-op in Australia and then became a coin-op operator in the States. Okay, so more of a business angle to it. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's a little play on words, your route to success, because uh, operators have routes. So, you know, they put a bunch of machines and then they they go through uh, the route and uh, pick up the coins. So, and remember, this is a deep recession in the United States. States, there's one industry that seems to be doing really well. There's a lot of desperate people who are going to try to become operators and fail miserably at it. Mm, okay. Yeah. By buying Battle Zone. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> so, blue sky dealers invade coin up market. Tons of people are jumping on the operator bandwagon, and a lot of scammers are fleecing them. Playmeter has an article about Leisure Time Electronics, a so-called blue sky company, promising an interchangeable system at a hefty price tag and delivers only mediocre games with a black and white monitor setup. So, so what's a blue sky dealer? Is that just, just a name of the dealers? or No, no. It's It means that they're selling you a blue sky. They're selling you a big, huge promise in the sky ah, that's not in there. That way, in that way. Yeah. Oh, okay. They're okay. promising you blue skies, wonderful mm. weather going forward. Yes. Uh, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, what these guys are are scammers. Uh, the way that they describe it is that some some of them will set up shop, you know, at a local hotel or something for a day or two, mm-hmm. and do these seminars on how to make money in this. And then they tell you that they will they'll sell you the equipment, these top of the line games, and you know, with fake uh, reports about how much they earn. They'll promise you, you know, you'll pay us. Uh, six grand for the machine it will make at least two hundred dollars a week and uh we'll even provide a service where for 170 bucks on top we'll find a location to place it at and all this other garbage Mm, okay and it's 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 taking advantage of a bunch of desperate people and uh, the article actually gives a really great profile of this one couple that just lost they, they went deep into debt like twenty five thousand dollars into debt uh just to uh buy the equipment it turned out that this company was they were working apparently with another company called centuri which is also a coin up company around this time i also think they may have done some pinball and 
they're selling these black and white games that probably would have been outdated in 78. Mm. And by 1981, 82, they're absolutely dreadful. Okay. And uh, first they promise them, you know, this is the first game and there'll be more games coming. And of course, the other games never arrive. Uh, they, they even gave this example that the game was Lunar Lander. Mm. And they put it in a frat house only to find out several weeks later that if you jiggle the joystick just the right way, you've got free credits. <laughs> and they figured this out weeks and weeks later, and the frat guys figured it out within a day. And so when they're going to c- collect the coins, there's nothing or virtually nothing in the coin slot oh, because okay. these guys were playing the game for free, you know, yeah. and crap like this. And it's just it's, – it's really sad, and you feel bad for the people getting yeah. fleeced. Yeah. So the video game scare hits the opinion pages. After a Christmas that saw massive sales of video game systems, it's no wonder that the opinion pages of newspapers are featuring rants by exasperated parents tired of the booming and blazing of their children's video games. One particular piece by a small town mother laments how the violence in her child's play is so alien to the peaceful cartoons of her youth with cats chasing mice and how destroying asteroids with lasers has replaced wholesome cowboys and Indians. (laughs) <laughs> and I wish I could have made up those examples. I that's, didn't. That's They're just wonderful. <laughs> I mean, okay. so one form of war is uh, replacing another, and that's a bad thing. It, well, destroying helpless asteroids as opposed to, you know, killing off those evil engines or something. Yes. I mean, it's <laughs> the, the lack of self awareness of this letter print, uh, that they printed is just painful so so painful yeah it definitely uh, sounds like that <laughs> i mean uh yeah but yeah so there's a whole series of these over several days in the uh, new york times i put i posted links to them it's definitely worth checking out and uh yeah these uh, this is going to go back and forth and unfortunately there is already a storm brewing on the horizon uh, this it's not going to just stop with a couple of people writing letters. Oh, no, indeed not. So because uh, then this next piece of news is that Ronnie Lamb takes on video games. One of the many campaigns to stop the advance of the video game parlor or arcade is being led by Ronnie Lamb. She will soon become the face of the anti-video game movement of the 80s, a mother of two who will lobby local governments and appear on countless TV shows decrying the evils of arcades and the moral decay they bring to the communities that house them. (laughs) It's funny. I mean, the the 80s were big on uh, things that that destroy the youth. Uh, Heavy metal, for one, for example. I mean, this is the time where where bands such as Judas Priest will release... uh, an album come album called uh, Ram It Down, singing yeah. about how metal is is actually is actually okay, and they're gonna fight for it. And uh, <laughs> lots of other big artists will uh, will in their lyrics actually um, talk about how they are being they're being seen as as evil. Yeah, because they're, they're playing hard rock or heavy metal. It's uh, it's it's weird weird today to to think of uh, how the the early to mid eighties were like this. Oh, and let's not even get started with the D and D backlash is say that. <laughs> is coming too. Right around, yes. it's right around this time when the D and D craze is going to happen. Uh, and so, yeah, it's. I mean, another article that I didn't include here is that TSR just announced that they're going to be building a brand new three million dollar new a headquarters building. Mm. Uh, so they are very much on the rise. Their their products also sold well over Christmas. And so it's, yeah, uh, there's, there's so many things. And I mean, you could argue a lot of this is being emboldened by Ronald Reagan being elected. Mm. Uh, a lot of these very conservative, morally conservative people who really did not have a voice before this um, feel like, well, we got this guy elected. We can do almost anything now. And it's, it's really going to be taking off. Plus you've got the, moral majority move uh, organization in the South doing all sorts of stuff, uh, anti-Roe v. Wade. So there's this whole 
backlash against the liberalization of the 60s and 70s mm. really coming in all at once at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but now uh, the there's a couple of follow-up opinion pieces that follow on on these letters and uh, the uh, Ronnie Lamb piece. Uh, one of them is from a child psychologist who works for Atari talking about the lack of evidence of children being quote, mesmerized by games and parents being fearful of computers due to their lack of growing up uh, without them. And a response from an angry parent to that letter. And that parent wishes uh, Atari would create games that allowed for productive activities like painting, composing music, or designing choreography as opposed to mindless destruction. Mm, Yeah, yeah. It's not completely off, no, just no. put it that way. Uh, and unfortunately, of course, the 2600 wasn't really going to be allow- allowing you to do much of that. That's where the no. computers came in. But yeah. Uh, and I you know I've got a lot of extra notes here on this topic just because it's kind of weird there. But David Rosen, chairman of Sega Gremlin, uh, he addressed the issue of games with arguments that would become industry standards, such as video games being, quote, active entertainment, as opposed to passive entertainment TV, and that games afford mental stimulation, not simply absorption. And my personal favorite, the greatest uh, little chestnut of them all, teaching hot hand-eye coordination and mental concentration, because I heard this nonsense so many times as a kid. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, we we human beings before video games didn't know uh, and didn't know how to use their hands in relationship to their eyes. That was an oh. unknown concept. <sighs> sorry, sorry. I know I'm 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 not the guy who's for game censorship. I just this argument was always so hollow and it just annoyed me. Um, and I guess okay, one more a- anecdote here. Uh, there's a trade publication called Games People Pay, not Play, Pay. It's for the uh, coin-op industry. And they have a two-page spread dedicated to a variety of local actions against games, as well as attempts by schools and organizations to use the machines as fundraisers. So uh, what we were talking about in 42, where the cities were the ones banning the machines or making the the use of the machines impractical or financially not feasible, Mm. the same thing is still happening. And uh, most other publications are also watching developments as the U.S. Supreme Court still has not decided the Alliance Castle Mesquite, Texas case. And we talked about this uh, last year, the year before, but this was a case where Mesquite, Texas, uh, there originally had been a permit for Alliance Castle to open up an arcade that's a big arcade chain uh, in shopping malls primarily or exclusively at this point. And then uh, the city council rescinded that, you know, because, oh, it's moral decay, blah, blah, blah. And Alliance Castle is suing to, you know, say this kind of ban based off of this argument is bull. And mm-hmm. the Supreme Court is going to side with Alliance Castle. Okay. okay. Uh, but Nobody knows how they're going to fall on this, and that's why everybody's sort of on pins and needles, because if they don't side with the Lance Castle, uh, there's so much of this undercurrent in society at this point, this, you know, moral high ground crap that you could see a whole slew of uh, of towns and cities suddenly banning stuff. Mm. Yeah, so it, it's in the air right now that the industry, especially the arcade industry, has to sort of defend itself. But, but uh, yeah, still, everybody bought a system over, over the holidays. Yeah, well, this battle is going to go back and forth for many, many years to come. So. Oh, yeah. So next piece of news is that the government antitrust actions end. Yeah, now, this is not directly related to games, but it is. So... A stock shot up on January 8th on the news that the government had reached a settlement with phone giant AT&T to break up their monopoly, divesting it of its local provider firms, a move that improved its stock valuation with hopes of greater profits from the more profitable long-distance and burgeoning data services sector no longer being burdened with local infrastructure maintenance. 
Stocks also saw a gain from the announcement that the 13-year-long federal investigation into IBM's market practices was dropped. So tell me, how what, what does this have to do with the computers and video games? Okay, so uh, again, a little bit of historical context. The uh, whole idea of anti-monopoly um, government actions goes way back in the United States, goes way back in most countries. Uh, and these kind of things, especially with these giant companies, AT&T was the phone company that had originally been set up. They had a monopoly. That's how you got phone wires and tele telegraph wires all over the country uh, because you couldn't stop them from putting there. They, it wasn't like you know a private landowner could say, no, you're not going to pass my land and the phone line's got to go around. No, they were allowed to put them pretty much everywhere that uh, in order to get phone service everywhere. Mm. Now, all of those local lines were a big maintenance cost. And so the government said, AT&T, you're too powerful. You control too much. Everybody's got to go through you for phone service. So we're going to force you to uh, split off all of your local stuff. So each local baby bell, as it would be called, because it was originally the Bell Telephone Company, mm. would... Um, now control a separate region of the nation as far as the local infrastructure, and AT&T would just be in charge of long distance phone uh, phone calls and data services. Yeah. So they got rid of all the stuff that was really expensive to maintain, left out with smaller companies that didn't have the same maintenance capabilities, thus a 40 year decline in the local infrastructure, but a much higher profit margin for the mother company because they now just get to sell you by the minute international calls and the like. Mm. Uh, but this is also going to establish, uh, it goes towards understanding why the internet takes off in the United States so much quicker than every place else, because local phone calls, that whole idea of we get to put lines anywhere we want, even though it's a private company, came with the caveat that they had to make local telephone calls free. Okay. So the, uh, so if you had a telephone line, they could still charge you a very basic fee. I mean, in the mid nineties, I was paying, I think 15 bucks for a basic line mm. a month, but then all my local calls were free. Okay. And so if my computer was calling up my local service provider, 24, seven, uh, 24, seven downloading stuff, where's, which it wasn't trust me, but it was, uh, <laughs> then that didn't cost me anything as far as the service charge. Okay. And that's why suddenly you had, you know, everybody in the United States in 1996, 97 is online, whereas in the rest of the world, everybody's counting the minutes, but you could do it in the States because of that. Okay. Uh, and the fact, though, that those lines never really get upgraded, where most of the country is still stuck with old copper wires as opposed to fiber optic, has to do with this decision that it's not yeah. a centralized monopoly and these little local companies are just not turning the profits necessary to do major investments. And because they're all small local ones, there's no way to put pressure on one centralized company to make the upgrades. Yeah, it makes complete sense. Yeah. Uh, and that's where the cable companies are going to come in and mm -hmm. provide that infrastructure separate. Yeah. And, yeah, I, I, I yeah. feel sure that the, in Denmark back in the day, in the late 90s or mid 90s, when I started the, well, actually early 90s, when I started using uh, bulletin board systems and so on and so forth, that uh, dial up was on local numbers was free after seven or eight at night. Mm. So when you're when you're way outside of the uh, business hours and until early morning, it'd be free. But uh, all the other uh, hours of the day, you'd be paying a uh, per minute charge. Exactly. And in Germany at that time, it was uh, per minute all day long. Yeah. So and maybe it wasn't free, but it was at least a lot cheaper at night, I remember. <laughs> yeah. And, and this is why the idea of casual internet use doesn't really take hold. The mm -hmm. idea that, you know, I got nothing else to do. Let's just surf the web for two hours. Yeah. Wasn't an option. Oh, but it really is an option option in the states and it's why you have this massive explosion of people building websites and mm. all these different services can be tried and it didn't matter if the download took two hours the download took two hours yep <laughs> uh, like i said there was, there was stuff i mean uh, get right was my best friend <laughs> yes uh and the ibm one 
And all of this is in the context of the Reagan administration is just closing this stuff up. Uh, they are going to take a very non-regulatory approach. We're going to going to probably talk about that briefly uh, this year or next year when they when they finally tell toy companies you can make thirty minute long commercials for your toys and w- let the onslaught of things like He Man and GI Joe and stuff begin. Mm. Uh, it all comes from this idea of no regulation, let the market decide. Okay, and so I, the. Uh, the anti-monopoly investigation of IBM, which had started 13 years earlier, so it was back when it was mainframes. Well, that's no longer it, – it's so far removed from the reality at this point mm. that it doesn't make much sense to go forward. And yes, they did abuse their power back in the day, but no longer. But it's very interesting that this has finally been dropped because – Many people believe that this was the main reason why IBM did not make DOS an exclusive. Yeah. Why Microsoft was allowed to sell DOS separately. Had that not been the case and DOS had only been had been owned by IBM, that only they could sell it, we would have never had the open PC platform we have today. Oh, that's true. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, very important decisions here that will have law that – one already had an effect uh, that will be long term. The other one will end up impacting infrastructure in a very massive way as, as for what we know today. Yeah. So while that is definitely a good thing that we have this this open ecosystem and, and have had that for many, many years now, um, just think that maybe if this hadn't happened, the Amiga would have won? No. The Amiga was always going to be a technological <laughs> dead end. Yes. As much as I loved not, it. Not because of the machine, but because of the people who were in charge. No, no, the machine. Uh, and we talked about this in our De- December 91 jump. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that was the problem with the Amiga 500 plus. Mm, yeah. That, that <laughs> as soon as they made any changes to the video uh, chip. Yep. You suddenly had anybody who had made custom, uh, really customized software that was taking advantage of the line by line processing of the video, which yep. is what this was using, suddenly didn't work as soon as you made any changes. Okay. You basically couldn't upgrade. You had to have all the legacy stuff in there going forward. And that's that, why that, it was a technological dead end. Yeah, that's true, and that's why you today you need an Amiga 500, not a, not a Plus, and an an A1200, and then you can play everything. Yeah, exactly. And the fact mm-hmm. that you couldn't play everything on the 1200 that was available on the 500 yep. was a huge problem. <laughs> yes. Uh, and this is why no, no, no. Uh, and this is also why last time we did the 40 year jump, um, I made that highlight of the fact that the IBM video card had its own memory. Mm. And that really changes everything because the Amiga and all these other systems at this point that are using DMA, the yep. direct uh, memory access, where it's one group of memory that you the programmer gets to decide where it goes, ultimately means you never have enough of anything ever. Yep. And you can't really just upgrade the one thing. So you need more video memory, just change out the video card. That doesn't work with a DMA system. Oh, true. Yeah. So as much as I would have loved to see the Amiga evolve and get better, as long as you were doing scan line based processing, you were never going to really ever be able to jump out and do something else. You needed a frame buffer. You did indeed. You did indeed. So Uh, Atari and Activision reach settlement. Atari sued against Activision and its four co-founding former Atari staff, Alan Miller, Larry Kaplan, David Crane, and Robert Whitehead, has been ended through a settlement. While the exact amount of this settlement was not announced, the parties disclosed that future Activision games for the VCS would be released, quote, under technology license from Atari. And so the suit would be because Activision were releasing games directly for the VCS without paying any uh, licensing fee to Atari? Well, it was more in uh, the idea that these guys knew how the whole thing worked and apparently they may or may not have taken some documents with them that they weren't allowed to take with them. Yes. So uh, there's going to be other companies that we've already talked about. iMagic uh, is prepping to launch their games. They didn't make it out for Christmas. But uh, they're going to be launching their games, and they're not going to be paying a license fee to Atari. 
Mm. Uh, and apparently Activision just paid a one big lump sum uh, to Atari, uh, but I'm not quite sure of the details of that either. Okay. So uh, again, this is an area where I really would have to do more of a deep dive, but a lot of it is still behind closed doors. I believe David Crane said in an interview that, you know, they just told him here, sign this, and there's a check going out, and that was it. And he didn't really care because they were making so much money at this point that even if they had to give a small percentage to Atari, that didn't matter. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But uh, it mainly was Atari had not locked the system. Atari had not set up a licensing structure because they never thought anybody would be making games for another system. Uh, you know, they just saw their competition as other console manufacturers. And this is really going to open up a floodgate by, especially by the time we get to Christmas of 82, there's going to be a lot of people producing games for the system. Yeah. 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 And of course, today it's it's all Microsoft because they now own. <laughs> uh, not yet. The, the sale hasn't gone through yet. Oh, hasn't uh, it? <laughs> uh, no. As far as I know, they haven't actually transferred the money yet. Okay. And it wouldn't surprise me if there's maybe some attempt to stop it as a anti-competitive thing, but probably not. Not in the mm. current. Uh, not with the current uh, government uh, uh, approach to things. So yeah, mm. Microsoft's going to own it. But yeah, it's yeah. Oh, I don't even want to. Uh, yeah, that's one of those ones where if I'm doing this show long enough, we'll be talking about this. Yes. And in 20 uh, years, in 20 years. And <laughs> I don't know, want to know what the repercussions of this, this is going to be because taking Activision off the board. I mean, what Sony by EA it, mm. It's it's crazy at this point. Sony doesn't have the money to buy up anybody. No. And, and yeah. Let's see what know. happens. Yeah. Ah, okay. So, sorry, everybody. Yeah. We're recording this right after Microsoft announced that they're going to be buying Blizzard Activision. Yes. For future people listening to this. Okay. Yeah. Let's keep going. So Mattel settles suit with Conic. Conic has paid a purported $375,000 in cash and an undisclosed royalty on all existing supplies of its electronic football games for infringing on Mattel's patents before ceasing production and sale of such devices. Okay, so Conic, at least the Conic that did the, uh, or well, never did the, the Conic multi-system. No, no, that's Conix with a K. Uh, uh, they don't okay. exist yet. They don't exist yet. They're coming. Uh, this is Conic, a company that was making little handheld electronic games, and they basically did a straight ripoff of yeah. Mattel's football. Okay. And uh, they've been in a suit now for a couple of years, and they finally closed it out. Uh, they're just going to liquidate their stock. But uh, all the anecdotes from the toy industry at this point are that – if unless you've got a licensed arcade game, electronics are dead. Okay. Yeah. And that's and that this is basically they're settling an old uh, thing, but it's already a dying business for both parties. Yeah, yeah. Can't be a lot of money in that anymore. No. The last piece of news: the UK declares 1982 to be the information technology year. Thatcher's government is moving full steam ahead with its support for the promulgation of computing in the UK, with the announcement that 1982 will be the year of IT. Whether there's support for their purchases of computers in schools and industry will make any real difference to a population already buying up machines at an increasing rate is yet to be seen. Mm. So more BBC micros for the schools. Yeah, I mean, uh, they're they're going to lean heavy into this. It's yeah. Uh, remember, historical context, this is the era when all the mines and shipyards and steel foundries and heavy industry in England is shutting down and disappearing. Yes. Uh, the economy is collapsing and the idea of high tech being the future for England is the idea that they're latching on to. And they will promote the crap out of these home computers, both in schools and at home, to reinvent the company, the country. And I mean, there's there's historical precedent. I mean, the first proper computer is created in England. A lot of the technology is going to come out of there. And they will continue to be a major player in chip design all the way up until today. Yep. And, it's, you know, it's just 
probably not the thing that's going to employ enough people to really make a dent in the economic swing. No, but the the ARM CPU, for example, that they are behind is uh, probably the most used today. Oh, by far, yes. Mm. I mean, yeah. alone alone when you think how many Raspberry Pis are sold, but then you add yeah. in all the cell phones and there you go. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I'm glad you mentioned it because the Raspberry Pi broke the record of a little thing that happened that got its premiere in January of 1982, but we won't be talking about it for another month or so. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just need to mention it here because it's so important. The up until the Raspberry Pi, most sole computer of all time was premiered at Comdex. The Commodore, the Commodore 64. 64. Yeah. Mm -hmm. ah. So it, it doesn't show up in any of the publications, even in the newspapers uh, this month, but we will definitely be talking about it very soon. Mm -hmm. And uh, But yeah, the Raspberry Pi took its crown as the most sold computer model, but I would yeah. argue it's not really a complete computer model. There's a keyboard or anything. But uh, I'll, I'll give it to him. Uh, it just uh, needs a bit of input and output devices, and then it's a complete computer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we just add all the things that are necessary, it'll be a real machine. <laughs> like, yeah. wasn't that the same excuse they gave for the Spectrum? Okay, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, this is final piece of news. Uh, that just uh, move here with the... Well, really getting uh, information technology and computers out there is, is what's started the, the uh, home brew scene in, in the UK, which, uh, well, is probably drive, a driving factor not only for the UK, but for all of Europe for uh, its proliferation within game development and development as such. So Definitely. I mean, uh, but the interesting thing here is also that your computer magazine makes the point that it's almost a non-issue because computers the computer sales are rising so quickly mm. already in england okay. we talked about the last few months how uh news a newspaper a magazine uh, the magazine company i can't remember the name of it is going to be selling this stuff uh the major chains are already selling uh computers partially because Sinclair has made the ZX81 and the ZX84, yes. it's so cheap and mm -hmm. easily accessible. Uh, you've got importers of the Atari and Apple lines. You've got Commodore pushing the VIC in a huge way. They've got big ads. They're, in all the, they're, they're getting into major retail outlets. So, you know, this was probably going to happen anyway in England, mm -hmm. but getting that government uh, endorsement really, really helps as well. It probably got a lot of people who would have been on the fence into it, especially because Thatcher at this point is still fairly popular. There's going to be a dip in the popularity. Mm -hmm. and some might say that that may or may not have contributed to certain actions that she's going to take. But yeah, it mm -hmm. really is one of those things where the it was going to happen anyway, but this is definitely going to help accelerate. Yeah, yeah. What I was mainly talking about was the uh, the move to buy lots and lots of computers for all of the schools, because when you interview people from the industry back in the day in the UK, nine out of ten will will say that that's where they picked up their interest in using computers. Oh, definitely. Mm. And it cannot be understated that making them accessible on that, that level really, really, really is important. Yeah. I mean, had I had that access in schools, I probably would have been even more addicted to the crap than I am uh, already was. <laughs> but I probably yeah. also would have done more with programming than I did because I never really felt like I had a, a proper in on that as a kid. Okay. So, you know, it's, yeah, that more organized and institutional approach really, really helped build that industry. Indeed. And, uh, of course, we're, we're going to see how their publishing work uh, didn't really pan out all that well. No. Uh, but definitely development was strong. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's it for our trip. Yes. We're done with January of 1982. All done. Mads, you have one more task as co-host to fulfill. Yes. What yes. is the word of the day? Oh, that would be easy. Of course, it's a roller coaster. Excellent. Because I'm going to go right out there and start playing that game once again and get, get all the way through it. Yeah, you, you should just film yourself doing it and post it as a long play. 
<laughs> yeah, could be. <laughs> and this time, crop the image properly. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. I'll try, man. Remember, everybody, if you want to see Mads play it, or at least most of Mads playing it, it's <laughs> going to be up on Patreon. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, everybody, thank you for being here, Mads. Thank you. Tell everybody where they can find you again. They can find me at the Retro Asylum, where I host uh, our podcast on retro gaming and on the Playthrough podcast as well, where we play more modern games and it's a more long form, waffly and very narrative focused podcast on gaming. And what are you guys playing right now? We are still playing The Last of Us Part 2. Been been playing that for a while. It's a long game. Yeah, it is. It is. Okay, cool. And remember, everybody, if you have comments for us, leave them. If you want to give us a thumbs up, we appreciate that, no matter what app you're in or five-star rating or whatever else. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you guys next time when we travel to January of 1992. Have fun. See you next time, mate. Bye. Bye.